Yeah, so hey guys, what's up? Uh, good day. Uh, welcome to uh, video number two. So today we're going to talk about lesson number two. Um, that is computer concepts. So let's start. Um, so first let's talk about classification of computers. So computers differ based on their data processing abilities and they are classified according to number one, you have the purpose. Um, the second one, you have the data handling, and the third one, you have the uh, functionality, okay? So, let us talk about purpose. Now, according to purpose, computers are either uh, general, uh, I mean general purpose, or a specific purpose. Let's talk about the first one. Now, general purpose computers are designed to perform a range of tasks they have the ability to store numerous programs but lack in speed and efficiency um, you know from from the name itself uh, this thing actually um, lacks in speed and efficiency because it runs and it works with program programs simultaneously well unlike the second one which is the specific purpose computers uh, these are designed to handle a specific problem or to perform a specific task. Now, a set of instructions is built into the machine. Now, this thing is very efficient, and when it comes to speed, it is way m much more faster than, um, you know, than the general purpose computer. So, a very good example of that is, um, for example, a computer, I mean, no, no, no a calculator, right? So a calculator is only specific to, or is only limited to, you know, computing sets of um, what um, instructions like, you know, adding, um, subtracting, um, multiplication, and division, right? So it, it only deals with um, equations and stuff. Right? So calculator is a very good example of a specific purpose computer. Now. Let's talk about data handling. Now, according to data handling, computers are, it could be analog, uh, digital, and, or hybrid. Now, let's talk about analog computers. So, analog computers work on the principle of measuring in which the measurements obtained are translated into data. Now, modern analog computers usually employ um, electrical parameters such as uh, voltages, uh, resistance, or Currents to represent the quantities being manipulated. So such computers do not deal with directly with the numbers. They measure continuous physical magnitude. So um, there's actually a lot of uh, analog computers that can be, you know, present inside your house. Uh, for example, you have the electric meter, right? Um, the I'm not referring to the new one. With, I'm not referring with the new model, but I'm referring with the old one. Um, the older version of uh, the electric meter is a very good example of an analog computer. Uh, this thing deals with, you know, measuring um, the voltage being used inside a certain household, and that, you know, that measurement is converted into data which can be used um, by, you know, the next computer that we're gonna talk about. So. This is a very good example of an analog computer. If you try to see, it's actually super complicated, right? Um, not unless if you're trying to use it, so I guess it won't be a problem to, you know, handle or navigate um, an analog computer, right? But this is like, you know, way more difficult than using a simple personal computer. Now, let's talk about second one. You have data handling. Now, according to data handling, um, computers are either analog, uh, digital, or hybrid. Um, so earlier we, we talked about the analog one. Actually, this is wrong. The, this should be number two. Uh, digital computers should be number two. And these are those that operate with information, uh, numerical or otherwise represented in uh, a digital form. So, such so as computers process data into a digital value in zeros or um, in ones. Now, they give the results with more accuracy and at a faster rate. So, zeros and ones, by the way, are what we call binary or binaries. Right? Um, 
I'll give you a very good example of uh, how we could describe zeros and ones. So when you try to key in on your keyboard, for example, you try to press uh, letter A, okay? So the computer doesn't read that as letter A, okay? Letter A means series of zeros and ones. It could be zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero. I'm not really sure, but that's how it looks like. Now, everything that you try to you know, input on the computer is in a representation of zeros and ones. That is how the computers know that this is letter A because it is represented in a form of zero one zero one zero zero one one. Or it could be that the computer will know that this is letter B because it is one one zero zero one zero one one one. Okay. Now the third one, number three, you have the hybrid computers. Now incorporate the measuring feature of an analog computer and the counting feature of a digital computer. So for computational purposes, these computers use analog components and for storage, uh, you know, they use the digital memories. So um, there are actually um, some you know quite good examples when it comes to hybrid computers for example um, let's talk about you know things that we could see today for example when you go into a shopping mall for example um, Gmail pineapple or you know any malls that you could think of during this pandemic when you get into the mall uh, the first person that will you know maybe greet you will be this person in white right um, carrying this um, hybrid uh, thermometer, right? If you try to, you know, ref refer that into the older ones, uh, thermometer uses this what we call, you know, it's like it can be found in the periodic table. We call it mercury, right? So it it rises up when it's hot, and then it, you know, it, it boils down when it's cold. Now, unlike a typical uh, mercury based uh, you know glass type thermometer uh, thermometer nowadays especially the ones that you can see in the mall which is you know the guard uses to you know stick in your forehead and then measure your temperature that thing is a combination of uh, analog which is serious like this part the measuring part in which that device measures your temperature okay and then for the translation part, uh, for it to get, you know, translated into numbers and, you know, get the, um, yeah, I mean, the data or information stored, you have the uh, digital computers on it, right? I mean, uh, I mean, there has this very small screen, okay, which will tell you what is your temperature. That part right there is the digital part of that device and it is a hybrid. Okay, now next, let's talk about, yeah, these are some examples of digital computers. The older version, CRT uh, type, you know, this TV-like old school computer, the white one. And then the newer version of the computer, the black one, right, with a wireless mouse on it. Now, these are also some examples of hybrid computers. It's actually a lot, right? Um, it's not just limited in a measuring temperature. It could be also measuring the heart rate. What else? Blood pressure is a lot, right? It's a lot. So most things are now hybrid. That's what you know we we normally use nowadays, right? Now, let's talk about functionality. Now, according to functionality, uh, there are types of computers. So again, we also have the analog computers. Okay, um, it's spelled analog in British English. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's analog or is a form of computer that uses continuous physical phenomena such as electrical or mechanical or hydraulic quantities to model the problem being um, solved. Um, we don't normally see this in a typical office setup. Sometimes or most of the times we see this in like you know a warehouse or in a manufacturing building right uh they use like hydraulic presses metal presses which uses the hydraulic power to flatten you know certain metal right it's also an analog computers because um it doesn't use 
human labor, right? For it to function. Now, second one, you also have uh, digital computers. So digital computers performs calculations and logical operations with uh, quantities represented as digits, usually in the binary number system, just like what I've said earlier, right? So there a good example could be your mobile phone, tablet, or laptop, right? Now, this is how an analog computer looks like. Um, this is telephone can. Um, this thing fetches radio frequency. I think this is like an old school telephony, right? Now, this is a very good example of a digital computer. Um, Mac, wow, Mac PC, I love this. I wish I could have a Mac though, I'm kidding. Now, uh, the third one, uh, you have the hybrid computers. Um, it's a combination of analog and then digital now. These devices or these computers are capable of inputting and outputting in both uh, digital and analog signals. A hybrid computer system setup offers a cost-effective method of performing complex situations. By the way, there are two types of signals. You have the analog signals and then the digital signals. So when you say digital signals, these are the signals uh, that flows into you know um, various type of media. For example, that cable which um, PLDT and ISP uses, right? So the data from your, you know, from maybe from your laptop or from your phone will be sent via these cables in the form of ones and zeros, okay? On your higher level, you will, you know, you will soon then realize um, how the data is being transported from one place to another, from your home to your ISP and to the other part of the world, okay? Now, this is an example of an hybrid hybrid computer. Uh, yeah, just like what I've uh, discussed earlier. Um, this is a digital thermometer, you know, um, an innovative one. Um, we also have the, uh, you know, the setup inside a car. If you guys have a car, car has this, you know, motion detection system. It's like this is capable of detecting its surroundings if the car is about to hit something something like that right now we also have the based on size based on size we have number one super computer right it's like superman now this is the fastest and the most powerful type of computer super computers are very expensive and are employed for specialized application and that require immense amount of mathematical calculations so for example uh, you have the weather forecasting uh, that requires a supercomputer other uses of supercomputers include um, animated graphics of fluid dynamic calculations nuclear energy research and petroleum exploration just in case guys if you will be able to get into the office of NASA there I believe you can find supercomputers because of course that's what they use to, you know, communicate with the satellite outside, right? It can't be done with just a very simple, you know, PC setup. Now it has to be done with a supercomputer. Okay. Now, um, this is uh, these are actually servers, um, big servers, um, but this is also um, a big part of supercomputers, right? These are, you know, the things that are used um, in storing and uh, accessing data simultaneously with the help of supercomputers, right? Now, let's talk about second one. You have the mainframe computer. Now, this is a very large and expensive computer capable of supporting hundreds or even thousands of users simultaneously. Now, in the hierarchy, that starts with a simple microprocessor, uh, let's just say in watches. Uh, for example, so at the bottom and moves to supercomputers at the top. Now mainframes are just below supercomputers, so he's like the Batman, right? You have the supercomputers that's the Superman, and then the mainframe computers is the Batman, right? Now mainframe computers are more powerful than the supercomputers because they support more simultaneous program. But supercomputers can execute a single program faster than a mainframe. Um, but overall, supercomputer is, you know, I, I would say much superb than uh, a mainframe computer, but they have different functionality, okay? 
um, again, um, supercomputers can execute a single program faster than a mainframe. What's their difference? Okay. Okay. So some examples of mainframe computers, you know, databases, servers, which support users all over the globe simultaneously. Okay. Now base in size. Now the chief difference between a supercomputer and a mainframe is that a supercomputer channels all its power into executing a few programs as fast as possible, whereas mainframe uses its power to execute many programs simultaneously. So again, when you say supercomputers, it focuses or channels all its power into executing like maybe a few programs so it can be done uh, the fastest possible time. Where, whereas when you talk about mainframe, it uses all of its power to execute as many as programs simultaneously. Okay, so we sometimes say it's a by sabai. Okay, now you also have mini computer. So mini computer, mid sized computer. In size and power, mini computers lie between like workstations and mainframes. Now, in the past decade, uh, the distinction between large mini computers and small mainframes has blurred. Okay, because again, the third in line is mini computer, but they are or mini computers are different from mainframe. Now, uh, however, as has this distinction between small mini computers and workstations, but in general, a mini computer is multi-processing system capable of supporting from th four to about 200 users simultaneously um by the way guys when we say computer like for example supercomputer or a mainframe computer or mini computer we, we we are not really referring to a physical pc setup wherein you can see like um you can see the monitor the keyboard the mouse and stuff no no it's not like that okay when you say super mainframe then the mini we're talking about it's it's cope it's capability it's efficiency okay now again uh, mini computers are capable of supporting four to about 200 users simultaneously so this can you know be typically seen in you know some companies and some huge buildings that has their own servers okay now um, and this is actually just quite a few I know this is like a typical piece of setup but when you compile a lot of workstations let's just say 200 uh, PCs in one in one infrastructure okay and it's being supported by you know servers um, yeah we, we can say it as a mini computer because of the number of uh, equipment it can support now we also have base and size you have um, microcomputer or personal computer okay now a very good example of these will be desktop computer now a personal or micro mini computer enough to fit on the desk that's the reason why a desktop computer is called desktop computer because yeah I, we need I'm not really sure if we need but it has to be placed on top of the desk that's the reason we call desktop okay so on the other hand you have laptop right so if the desktop is placed on top of the desk the laptop should be placed on top of your lap okay that's uh, somewhere in your legs right it's the reason why it's called laptop but it's just the name though I mean we can put laptops everywhere right even in a boat maybe <laughs> kidding so um, a laptop computer is a portable computer complete with an integrated screen and keyboard. It is generally smaller in size than a desktop computer and larger than a, a notebook computer. So it's like um, a built-in like five-in-one kind of desktop computer, right? Uh, the monitor is there, uh, the keyboard is there, um, the t touchpad, uh, mouse control is there, um, speakers. Uh, are there right so that's their differences but technically are the same because they, they belong to microcomputer or we normally say personal computer because it belongs to someone or an individual right okay good now 
this is um, how a typical desktop computer looks like. You have the monitor, you have the system unit, you have the keyboard, you have the mouse. Uh, this is the lighthouse. Uh, I wish you could see that you know, lighthouse in person. A laptop computer, right? Um, yeah, you have the keyboard, you have the touchpad. Um, I guess that most of the um, laptops today have a built-in cameras on it. Speakers, you have the Bluetooth, uh, the network adapter, and you know, all of uh, the important thing that can be found on the desktop computers, okay? Now, you also have number six, you have the Palm Top computer. So again, it's called Palm Top because it can be placed on top of your palm here, okay? Now, Palm Top computer, a digital diary or notebook, or PDAs. PDAs, by the way, means personal uh, digital assistance with an S. Okay, with no S, it's PDA, personal digital assistance. Okay, so what are the very good examples? By the way, um, palm top computers or PDAs are a hand size computers. Um, palm tops have no keyboard, but the screen stores both as an input and an output device. The very good example of that are your mobile phones, right? You can input by simply keying in using the keyboard and you can see the output by simply you know watching it over the screen well unlike a laptop but there are some laptops you know where you can do touch screens right but let's talk about desktop computer instead so when you say um, desktop computers when you say input you can just input through the keyboard okay you can not input something through the monitor the th you know that's their huge differences between between the desktop uh, laptop versus palm top okay now you have number seven uh, you have workstations now a terminal or a desktop computer in a network in this context workstation is just a generic term for a user's machine you have the client machine in contrast to a server or a mainframe okay um, for example, um, in uh, DNSC, we also have our uh, server, our mainframe, right? It's a um, place in the Institute of Information Technology building to where, you know, um, the web and all the data um, enclosed in the uh, college are there. Now, who are uh, the users? Or who are the users for the user machine? You have you, right? You're trying to access DNS LMS. You're trying to access IAMS, right? Or maybe we could you know, refer it to a typical um, internet cafe setup, right? Now, when you get into an internet cafe, you have this, you know, guy. You know, sometimes we, we call him the server, right? But he is not the server. He's, he's just the operator of the server, which is the computer in front of them, okay? And then you also have the client machines, you know, station one, two, three, down to station 11, okay? Now, uh, let's talk about palm tops. Again, this is, wow, an iPad. Mini iPad or iPad mini. Palm tops, again, can be, um, or its primary function is, uh, to be a personal digital assistant which is being held by our palm right now workstation right and uh, now let's um <clears throat> let's talk about computer components now um there are actually two computer comp major components of a computer system we have um the hardware and the software but let's talk about the hardware first okay now hardware these are the components form the complete computer system now a computer system is made up of four okay four main types of components now number one you have the input devices so you have the keyboard uh, you also have the mouse right this is a wireless mouse okay um, when you say input devices, these are the things that allows you as a user to put something into the computer, right? To input something into the computer, okay? So it, it's not just limited with text, uh, numbers of letters. It could be also like video like this, like what I'm doing. I'm trying to input something on the computer. It's like a video, 
an audio tool, like a microphone, right? These are some examples of um, input devices. Now, in contrast, you have output devices. Now, very good example of which is uh, you have monitor, you have speakers, right? The purpose of these devices is to let the user see something. Like, it's the reason why it's called output because the screen displays what you want to be displayed on the screen. Uh, the speakers, you know, let you hear what you want to hear. Okay? Now, uh, you have number three, you have secondary uh, storage devices. Uh, very good examples are hard disk, drive, uh, you have CD, we call it compact disk, you have the DVD or the digital video disk drive, and you know, many more. Now, the reason why they are called uh, secondary storage devices because their purpose is to store, um, you know, files for uh, repository purposes, like for archival purposes. Now, uh, we also have number four, you have the processor and primary storage devices, okay? By the way, hard disk drives belongs to, or we sometimes know it as ROM, ROM, or read-only memory. Later, I will explain what is the read-only memory all about. But on number four, you have the processor and primary storage devices. One is a CPU, we call it a central processing unit. And then the RAM, you have the random access memory. Okay. Now, you might be wondering why, you know, ROM or the hard disk drive belongs to the secondary storage devices and the RAM or the random access memory uh, belongs to the uh, primary storage devices. Okay. It is because RAM is the one so responsible for knowing what you are working with right now. Um, for example, um, at this moment you're working with, let's just say, you know, your activity and then you're using Microsoft Word, okay? Now you want to go to your kitchen and eat something and then you just let your PC stay in that way. Now, your computer tries to remember that even if you left, your computer is still working on with the Microsoft Word. And you might be wondering why why the computer knows that. It's because through the help of RAM or random access memory. Now, you might be also wondering why when you try to open up a lot of applications, okay, your computer, your laptop, your phones may lag. It's L A G, lagging, right? Or it, it works slowly, right? It is because RAM has its capacity. It's like me trying to remember the names of my students. If my capacity is just, or if my limit is just up to, I can just only remember 50 students. So any student that exceeds that limit can't be remembered by me. So there's a reason why when you try to open programs, um, you know, simultaneously with a lower, you know, memory size for your RAM, sometimes it lags, right? That's the reason why. So, um, yeah, these are some examples of input devices, right? Um, you have the keyboard, um, you have the mouse, right? You have um, a scanner, because you, know, you try to scan and then get something into the computer. It's still an input device. You have the camera, so you try to capture a photo and then store it on the device. Uh, microphone is a very good example of an input device too. You have output devices, you have the monitor, so it you know, lets you see something you want to be displayed on the screen. You also have headsets, because you know, it allows you to hear some sounds, music, you have printers, and then speakers. These are some examples of output devices, okay? Actually, there's a lot, you know, you just only need to think about their main functionality, right? Whether it will allow you to put something into it or get something out from it, okay? That's how you differ output and input devices. Now, this is a very good example of a secondary storage devices, right? This is a hard disk drive, 
and we sometimes call it as ROM or a ran read only memories because again the data that gets into it is only read only um, by the way guys when you try to open a um, hard disk drive this is how exactly what it looks like it's like a pile of disks that has this um, um, you know this pin reader and then when you try to access a certain file for example you want to access your file um, on drive T on a particular folder and then that this will spin you know spin in hell try to find that data where you save it is because the data is being written on top of that disk okay that only the computer can read and understand though okay now you also have the processor and um, sorry for the chicken we have the farm at the back sorry about that okay where am I so um, let's talk about processor and uh, primary storage devices. This is how, I mean, this is how a processor looks like. This is the CPU, central processing unit. Okay, the typical case that we normally see is not a CPU, that it is a system unit. Okay, again, uh, from now on, and I want you guys to um, understand that the CPU is that small thing box like inside the system unit the case that we normally see to where you push and hit the power button and that's the system unit okay now Intel by the way is one of the very good brands for um, processors right along with AMD for gaming okay now software second one so the term software refers to the set of electronic program instructions or data a computer processor reads in order to perform a task or operation now um, in contrast the term hardware refers to the physical components that you can see or uh, you can touch such as the computer hard drive the mouse uh, the keyboard any input or output devices, yeah, they belong to the hardware part. Okay, the software part, something that you can see but you can't touch. Okay, let's talk about software. Now, software can be categorized according to what it is designed to accomplish. Okay, what is role, its purpose, right? There are two main types of software. You have the systems software and the application software. Now, let's talk about them. First, let's talk about the systems software. Now, it includes the programs that are dedicated to managing the computer itself, like the overalls, like the backbone, okay? Such as the operating system, uh, file management utilities, uh, the disk operating systems, or DOS, that's disk operating system. Uh, the operating system, we normally say OS, Okay, manages the computer hardware resources in addition to applications and data without systems software installed in our computers we would have to type the instructions for everything we wanted to computer to do right so software on and uh, hardware they're like buddies right they're like Batman and Robin um, they need to like to collaborate to, to work on with each other right now, a very good example of a system software is the OS, the operating system. You have the Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, you have the Androids, iOS versions and stuff, right? These things are capable of making the hardware work. Without these, your hardwares are useless. Also, at the same time, system software are the ones responsible at making your application work. So without the uh, operating system installed on your, maybe on your phone or on your PC, an application wouldn't work at all. So we have number two, we have application software, or simply we call it applications or apps for short, right? Um, they're often called productivity programs or end user programs because they enable the user, which is like, for example, me to complete tasks such as like creating documents through MS Word, um, spreadsheets, um, databases, 
and um, publications, doing online research, like sending email, uh, designing graphics, running businesses, and even playing games, right? Um, application software, you have Facebook, you have Facebook Messenger, you have Mobile Legends, uh, you have Gmail, you have Google Meet, Microsoft Word, it's a lot, right? You call it an application because again, they are intended for the end user like us, okay? So, um, again, without the system software, application software are useless, okay? But of course, if we don't have the application software, you know, soft system software are useless too. I mean, what can we do with the system software if we don't have the application software, which is dedicated to us people, right? End user. Now, software. An application software is specific to the task it is designed for, and it can be as simple as a calculator application or as complex as a word processing application. Now, when you begin creating a document, uh, the word processing software has already set, uh, set the margins, font style, size, and the line spacing for you. Right? You might be wondering why when you try to open the word and try to like create a new document. Why is that so? The margins, the font style, the size already preset, but you can change these settings, right? Depends on you. And you have many more formatting options available, right? For example, uh, the word processor application makes it easy to add like color, text color, you have the text fill color, um, headings, you have the pictures, or delete, copy, move, and change the document's appearance to suit your needs, right? So. Again, a Word, MS Word, or any like WPS are some very good examples of uh, application software. Now, these are some examples of system software. You have the uh, Mac iOS. Um, you have what? You have the Windows, right? Operating system. You have Linux. It's an operating system too. Okay. Again, system software aren't designed for us, but they are more designed to, you know, make hardware work so we can use application software. Now, application software you have, yeah, we have the Word, you have the Gmail, YouTube, um, Google Drive, Mobile Legends, Facebook, Facebook Messenger app, and a lot, right? Now, let's talk about the types of computer users. So. Maybe you guys are one of these. So we have home office users, workers, you have mobile users, we have power users, and large business users. So let's see uh, where you belong. So uh, let's talk about types of, uh, actually it's types, types of computers. Okay, let's talk about the first one. You have home user. So home user, are one of the most common type of computer users they are they use computers for things like education research and entertainment again um, doesn't really only you know deal with computer like the PC okay when they say computers it could be um, a palm top um, a laptop a desktop but the point is it's just I mean the scope is only up to you know, doing your personal thing. That's the reason why they are called home users, right? Like me, I'm doing, you know, some teacher stuff, right? Maybe some student stuff. So I am a home user, okay? Now, um, you have types of computer users. So home office user workers. So they use computers to aid them in their work. Very good example is me. Uh, these people work from home accomplishing their work through a computer. So I am a home office user or a home office worker. All right. You also have mobile users. Uh, mobile users are anyone that uses a device that can be carried from a place to place. Right. That's the reason why it's called mobile phone because it's not just mobile, but when you say mobile, it's like, you know, it's like the thing that allows you to move from one place to another place very smoothly. It's the reason why it's called mobile, right? Mobile phone. Okay, so um, example of mobile devices are phones. Um, you have PDAs or personal digital assistants, and you also have laptops. Okay, now um, you also have power users. 
uh, power users are people who use computers for things like running servers and uh, graphics design. So much likely they use like a heavy duty kind of uh, uh, computers, right? Uh, they generally need a more powerful computer to support the programs they run, power computers. So, um, but by the way, when you get into the field of uh, designing, you know, photography, videography, and designing, you really need to have, you know, a powerful or a much powerful kind of uh, computer, right? It is because when you deal with designing, they they require with you know much efficient and then um, you know efficient and fast kind of uh, computers, right? Uh, we also have the fourth one. We have the large business users. Um, so they are large groups of users that run under the same server. So though they are called large business users, schools also use the same type of setup to support many users under the same network, which we are trying we are the best examples are you and me we are trying to access IAMS or maybe dnc lms right and the server is somewhere in a very secure room in the institute of information technology building but uh, we are the end user so a school setup is also considered as a large business user or we are part of the large business users right Okay, now let's talk about the computing environment. Now, computing environments, when we want to solve a problem using a computer, the computer makes use of various devices which work together to solve that problem. Now, there may be a various number of ways to solve a problem. Um, we use various number of computer devices arranged in different ways to solve different problems. Now, the arrangement of computer devices to solve a problem is said to be a computing environment uh, the formal definition of a computing environment is as follows, okay? So, you have computing environment is a collection of computers which are used to process and exchange information to solve various types of computing problems, okay? Um, for example, um, if we are tasked to, like, create a letter that will be signed by the dean, right? So that is an example of a computing problem. Now, how do we solve it? We use a computer to you know, uh, create that letter through the help of an application software. We call it an MS Word to you know, create a digital format of that letter to be printed uh, with the help of an output device. We call it printer and be signed by the dean, by the dean rather, sorry. So yeah, so this is an example of a typical computing environment setup right so we actually have a few so the following are the various types of computing environments you have personal computing environment um, you have time sharing computing environment you have client server or client server computing environment you have distributed computing environment you have grid computing environment and you have cluster computing environment let's talk about the first one now when you say personal computing environment, it is a standalone machine. In a personal computing environment, the complete program resides on a standalone machine and executed from the same um, from the same machine, like you know, laptops, you have mobile devices, printers, uh, scanners, and the computer systems we use at home. Just exactly the same thing what I'm doing now. Um, office are the examples for the personal computing environment, or me doing this recording using my you know, my keyboard, my, my laptop and stuff, right? So this is a personal computing environment because it only deals with me and my own computing problem. The, my problem is how am I going to deliver the kind of learning? So I use the computer and then, uh, you know, a recording application so I could deliver the, you know, the learning to you. So this is a very good example of a computing, personal computing environment, right? Now, Time sharing computing environment is a standalone computer in which a single user can perform multiple operations at a time by using a multitasking operating system. Um, this actually requires a very good computer unit. Now, here the processor time is divided among different tasks, and this is called time sharing, right? It's like, um, you know, for me, um, I'm handling BSIS 1A, BSIS 2A. BSIS 2B, BSIS 2C, BSIS 3A, and BSIS 
be. It's like, think of it that I am the processor and I have to divide the task among each set. They call it time sharing. Exactly the same thing how the time sharing computing environment works, right? And then, uh, for example, a user can listen to music while writing something on app again. That can be done on a laptop, right? Maybe on your mobile phone, you can listen to music while, you know, um, composing reply to someone through Facebook Messenger, right? So again, a user can listen to music uh, while uh, writing something in a text editor. Uh, Windows 95 and later versions of Windows OS or operating systems or iOS and Linux operating systems are the examples of this computing environment. Like you can watch a video, you can listen to music, you can type, write or something, yeah time sharing computing environment. Now, let's talk about client server computing environment. Now, it contains two machines. You have the client and you also have the server, right? Client machine and the server machine. Now, these both, um, I mean, these machines will exchange, or both of these machines will exchange the information through an application. Now here, client is a normal computer like a PC like again a typical internet cafe setup it could be a tablet or it could be mobile yeah etc and a server is a powerful computer which stores huge data and manages the huge amount of file and emails so to make it simple it's like an internet cafe setup right um, there's like this server thing that you know serves every client inside the internet cafe if you refer that to our school Right. There is this server somewhere in a secure room in the Institute of Information Technology building which serves all the clients. I mean, who are they? They are the students and the, the teachers, faculty, and staff um, of the Davao the Largest State College. Okay. Now, the client server environment, um, the communi communication between client and server is performed using HTTP. We call it a high, uh, hypertext transfer protocol. You guys might notice HTTP when you visit some you know, websites. Right? A certain link usually starts with HTTP colon forward slash forward slash and triple w dot let's just say google.com okay it's because it's a client server for example HTTP colon forward slash forward slash um, triple w dot facebook.com you as a client tries to request for an access about your profile um, to Facebook okay which Facebook has their server somewhere in uh, I'm not really sure but I guess somewhere in US they store it somewhere in US so that's a client and server you know a relationship so client server computing environment you also have uh, distributed computing environment. Um, the complete functionality of the software is not on a single uh, computer but is distributed among multiple computers. Here we use a method of um, yeah we use a method of a computer processing in which different programs of an application run simultaneously on two or more computers. Wow it's actually uh, quite heavy. Now, these computers communicate with each other over a network to perform uh, the complete task or to perform or complete the task. Now, in distributed computing environment, the data is distributed among the different systems and that the data is logically related to each other. It's like a typical you know, business network kind of a setup in which there are two or more computers work together to perform a single task okay so you have the grid computing environment now grid computing is a type of distributed computing again you have the distributed computing but the grid computing is just a type of distributed computing um, that combines the resources of interconnected groups of several independent computers that communicate through the use of a network in a way that makes them look and act like a single computing entity. Um, this will just be very brief and uh, just, will just be an overview, but later on your higher years, guys, you will be uh, learning a lot more when it comes to grid computing. 
But you might be wondering why it's so put in a very simple way, why we can't communicate to each other, maybe locally, uh, within you know within the states. It's because of a, uh, you know, uh, because of the network. Okay. Now each computing task is broken down into smaller pieces and is distributed throughout the available computing resources for execution. Now these pieces are processed in parallel, and as a result. Uh, completion is achieved in a smaller amount of time. Um, again, on the later part of this subject and on your higher year, especially when you, when you guys will go to uh, the next semester, you will know more about grid computing. Now, let's talk about the cluster computing environment. Uh, it's a collection of interconnected computers, so it could be like a typical, you know, in a cafe setup or bigger than that. Okay. Now, these computers work together to solve a single problem. In a cluster computing environment, um, the collection of systems work together as a single system. Um, you know, things that we normally see in a movie, right? You wish you could see like a clustered computer, but they have, you know, one single or one common goal uh, that is to resolve a problem. Sometimes we, we see that um, you know, they sometimes portray it in NASA or in some bigger agency, right? Um, in, you know, in, in, uh, in that scenario, you guys will see a lot of uh, systems that work together, you know, and we sometimes see it like a single system, but it's being done by multiple units. Now, uh, and uh, by the way, that is at the end. Um, we will have like a part two with the computer concepts. So I'll be, you know, posting the video um, for the much detailed um, discussion about computer concepts. So I'd like to say thank you for watching this video and stay tuned. I'll keep you guys posted.